Well, I'd like to thank everyone for, for coming today. I think uh, attendees are still um, signing in. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll start by kind of giving a, a quick state of play on uh, the market, uh, on where markets stand um, ahead of COP21 in Paris, as we all know, starts uh, this weekend. So, and oh, I'd also like to thank um, Eva and her team at Carbon Market Watch for organizing this um, webinar, and also the participants who I will introduce shortly. So, um, basically, uh, just to give a, a quick synopsis, the the latest negotiating text, um, which uh, was released following. Um, the latest rounds of negotiations last month in uh, on It stands at around 34 pages. It's still quite heavily bracketed. And uh, to the content of, of uh, many, at least in, in our, in our uh, market, in many of our contacts, um, provisions to support market-based mechanisms and international carbon trade have been added back to the text. Um, they were removed earlier. Um, but it still appears that, the, well, the text is, well, there's a myriad of options listed in there, so it really uh, remains to be seen which way things are going to go. Um, as you all know as well, um, INDCs have been coming in kind of uh, quickly over um, the past few weeks. We're, so of the nearly 200 countries, um, I think we're at around 180, we're approaching 180 submissions. So um, we at Carbon Pulse did a, uh, uh, an analysis earlier this month, or sorry, last month, uh, looking at, um, oh, I, sorry, I'd like to apologize as well. There's, there's a bit of background noise on when I'm speaking just because I'm in a, uh, uh, a shared office. Um, so unfortunately that's uh, that's all we can afford at Carbon Pulse at the moment. So once the other speakers um, start to present, uh, I'll mute my microphone so you can hear it better. Um, so yes, the INDCs that are in, um, the INDCs that are in um, basically um, around, I think about half of them cover markets. Um, or request uh, markets are included in, in the text, um, and these countries are saying they would support markets. But the majority are uh, will likely be um, uh, sellers of, of uh, emissions units. So they'll basically look to tap markets to help them raise funds to um, complete their their mitigation uh, options. So one of the big questions is, even if there are markets uh, in the final agreement, where is the demand going to come from? Because um, at the moment, there's only a handful of countries that have indicated that they will likely be, be buyers. Um, and then, so just to kind of summarize what, our, in our view, what the potential outcomes for pairs are in regards to the markets. Um, and I think that the panelists will, do, will expand on this uh, in their presentations. But basically, it could range from an overarching kind of command and control new market mechanism. It's looking a bit less likely, um, or it could be anything from carbon clubs to a, a kind of linked plug-and-play network where where countries um, use a loose framework with the UN um, and kind of plug into a system there, and then uh, a network of, of uh, uh, basically a network system that would recognize and assign values to uh, based on the various mitigation efforts. And obviously, nothing in any of the agreement is, uh, is also an option. So um, that's where we stand now. I'd like to pass to Eva from Carbon Market Watch to uh, give some quick opening remarks before we, we start the presentations. Thank you, Mike. Um, for starting off um, on this webinar. Um, thank you everyone for participating and for your interest in joining us today. Um, I would actually like to take the opportunity to, um, ex to inform you from um, all, all places the, of the world. Um, there's 214 
um, registrations that we received. So um, given the state of the cover market at the moment, which is um, not a secret that is not doing very great, um, there seems to be still a lot of interest, and especially really from all corners of the world, ranging from New Zealand and Japan all the way to Costa Rica, um, and also um, some Af African colleagues. Um, um, on the on the webinar today. So welcome everyone, and I hope we'll have, um, have some time for discussion afterwards. Thanks for already for sharing your comments and um, questions beforehand. So just adding on to what Mike already said and putting us in, in the context of today um, is really that there are mixed messages regarding the rule of markets and that the rule markets may play in the Paris Agreement. Um, from the INDCs and especially maybe <clears throat> to mention industrialized countries that have um, largely put forward domestic pledges. Only Switzerland and New Zealand have um, made an exception and, um, and um, to an extent Norway. Um, the, the, the INDCs are largely based on domestic pledges. Um, yet, and the political reality looks a bit different. Um, there are more than 40, 40 jurisdictions that have already um, um, started pricing mechanisms. Um, what Mike already said as well is that the latest bond negotiations really changed the spirit in what markets are being discussed now at the UNFCCC level. Um, from no mentioning before October, we have now about five pages of language proposals um, in the negotiation text. The question for Paris is, is hence, what will remain, what will not? Um, and um, well, let me just also um, add a few few points as to why we um, wanted to design today's webinar, not only looking at Paris, but also what this um, Paris Agreement will mean for EU's climate policies. It's not only because of the EU. I mean, the the Paris implications will have um, will also be relevant for all regional climate policy developments around the world. But um, us being based in Brussels, obviously, we're focusing on the um, EU climate policy reforms, and we think they're quite good, exemplary for whatever happens around the world. Ontario is developing the carbon market at the moment. They're looking at the EU, and so are other regions. And um, and why we think EU, the EU example is, is a good example in, in, in discussing how important the mentioning or not no mentioning of carbon market is in, is in Paris Agreement is because, for example, the EU's INDC are, are based on domestic mitigation only, so whatever decisions there will be in the Paris Agreement on markets, what will this mean for this domestic mitigation commitment. Um, the EU is also at the same time um, negotiating its linking, linking at EU ETS with Switzerland at the moment, um, some, something that could possibly be a precedent for any future linking developments. Um, and um, many of you know that the EU ETS is currently under, under fundamental reform with a lot of issues being discussed. One of the greatest challenges is to contain the pre-2020 surplus that has been has accumulated under the emissions trading system and how to keep this from the 2030 climate commitments, something that's also very relevant in the context of the international debate um, and, and how how this relates, for example, to the surplus that exists under the international emissions trading system. Um, against all this context, we would like to um, tackle today's webinar with following objectives in mind. Um, first of all, we'd like to understand the proposals that are now included in the negotiation text. What do they mean um, and how can we interpret them? What do we expect from Paris? Um, we'd also like to map out the potential risks of the carbon markets design um, that will be included in the Paris um, agreement and how and what this will mean for the integrity of the agreement. Um, one more technical but still very um, relevant point is how, how the joint fulfillment op options in the treaty will be played out in practice and what the role of an international accounting framework would have to play. Um, and finally, we'll draw some lessons on what all this means for EU's climate policies and vice versa. Um, with that, I'd like to um, pass on to the next speaker and, um, well, um, wish everyone a joyful webinar and um, lots of inspiring questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva. Um, so we will start with our four speakers. I'll, uh, I'll introduce them as we go. Um, so first to kick off is Andre Martin from the Center for European Policy Studies, who's going to talk a bit about um, market references in the Paris draft text. Take away, Andre.
Hello? 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 Hi, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Fine. Thank you very much, uh, Eva and, and Mike, for, for inviting me for this uh, this tele this webinar. Uh, uh, I, this is an, a, a topic: uh, carbon markets and the role of carbon markets and the architecture of carbon markets in the 2015 agreement. It's something that has been, in in, in many ways, not been placed on the front front burner. But at the end of the day, it will play a very important role for a variety of reasons. Uh, especially if we consider that over the last number of years, markets have been, if you want, the highlight of many of the things that have happened around the world. Not always appreciated by everybody, but nevertheless undisputable, they were there. Now, uh, okay, so the Paris Agreement, uh, the Paris Agreement will need to have a number of, of things in it. One of them is we'll have to address the international transfer of mitigation outcome. This is what an international agreement does. Uh, it is not meant to be uh, a, 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 a uh, uh, agreement that will dwell into the national uh, markets or the international pricing system, but what it will address is the international transfer of mitigation outcomes. It will not create markets, neither did the Kyoto Protocol create markets. It will create, or it presumably will create, the condition for the emergence of international markets for compliance with the national determined contribution. It will not create a global price of carbon. That has been mentioned many, many times. Uh, I think that has been something that has been a little bit in fashion over the last number of months, mentioning that uh, we should have a global carbon price in the agreement, but this is not what it's all about. And First and foremost, what it will do is it will allow for a future conversion of carbon prices to the international markets. What needs to be in an agreement, and this, this is my view, uh, one way or another, a number of functions need to be, uh, to be in the agreement. One of them is that it will have to be able to transfer mitigation outcomes, uh, mitigation outcomes, and be able to count these transfers towards commitments under NDCs. So it's a very fundamental thing. It doesn't, it's not supposed to be mentioning the word market. There's no reason to create, to mention the word markets. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol has created essentially the, uh, uh, through Article 17, the ability to transfer an account and, and, uh, and account for this, this transfer between various uh, jurisdictions. Uh, it has to ensure there are proper rules for accounting, including the avoidance of double counting. And, and also, probably as a last item, have the ability to create a protocol or a series of protocol mechanisms that may be used by party to create reduction units. The, the CDM may be an example in that vein. Now, in the sense of what do you have, what can you have in the, in the agreement, and what do you have in the text right now? If you look at the text uh, of, of, of that is being put forward, talking about the agreement text, uh, to some degree also the, uh, the decision text, is, is, is a lot of it is copy-paste into the agreement text. You have a, a general level of granularity, and that general level of granularity which would have provisions that will provide a blessing or legitimacy of international cooperative approaches. This kind of stuff is already available in the framework convention in, in climate, uh, of climate change. Uh, but I think that it needs to be in a more general side of the agreement. I think that we need to make sure that this is something that could be dealt only in markets or could be dealt in general with all cooperative approaches. But some reference in general to cooperative approaches, I don't think is unimportant. Now, the second grand level of granularity, if you talk about general having cooperative, international cooperative approaches under the Paris Agreement, the second level of granularity is a type and form of cooperation. And here you could mention different type of mechanisms, whether you have the, uh, uh, you know, what is, what we'll talk about the sustainable development mechanism or international transfer, these are different types of cooperation. And finally, the, the last format is to establish a specific mechanism, to establish, uh, define or establish a specific mechanism. The ones that have been banded around that I'm giving you as them as examples could be anything, CDM plus, RED plus, mitigation and adaptation mechanism that, that uh, Bolivia has been uh, bringing up to the fore. Now, uh, in the agreement text, what do we have right now? We have Article 9, uh, Option 3B5, uh, to be relatively precise. 
is uh, it's a it's a uh, indirect recognition of transferability. It's the ability to account for transfers. Uh, it is very positive because it is put in the accounting section, so it's clearly uh, related to the to that part that is it's it's acceptable to everybody. But at the same time, it just refers to the ability to transfer without kind of offering a specific permission. And that is not bad for the simple reason that many would not want to have a specific permission. They do not seek a specific permission. Actually, they reject the specific permission for the simple reason that they feel that that permission exists. Then if you, if you ask for permission, then you may not get it, or you may get it in a way that you don't want it. So have it in a way which is indirect, I think, may, may make a, a number of, of parties happy. It does recognize and goes into the double counting, uh, and that is not an issue because everybody is for, for avoiding double counting. Article, it's not Article 3, uh, 16, I think it's Article 3, Paragraph 16, which deals on cooperative approaches. Uh, there are, it is a, a chapeau that could fit all cooperative approaches. Option one, in, which is it's a very general option, it could be enough because it talks about having international cooperative approaches, but it is not really enough because it's too general. I mean, you could read into it leaving Paris and going in 2016 in a work program that somebody is telling you you can have a cooperative approaches, but in my view, it is, yeah, I mean, you can interpret it like this, but it's a real stretch and you end up in a real fight. If, if the, the only provision in this agreement about markets or transfers is this, you're going to get into enormous fight next year. Uh, option two, option two provides a more a, a general coverage with different levels of details and provision in some cases uh, that narrow the scope of cooperation. In this case, in this case, you have uh, you will have the same provision that you can have cooperation, but then you get into the level, the next level of detail when you start talking about you're going to have transferability and you have and you can have uh, uh, different mechanisms, but then it starts getting into the specific mechanism. Uh, it then gets into, into provisions that narrow the scope of cooperation because it makes reference to additionality. Now, additionality, if you're talking about cooperative approaches, you talk about additionality, you automatically get yourself into a baseline and credit mechanism because that's where additionality comes into play, and then all of a sudden it eliminates anything to do with pure transfers. So I would say that this, this particular uh, uh, article uh, uh, in, into, into uh, paragraph uh, uh, 16 becomes a very uh, hodgepodge of things at different levels, at different levels of granularity. I don't think it's a useful thing. It may be well-intentioned, but not useful. Option three gets into a discussion of uh, the uh, of the different levels of uh, jurisdiction that can play into cooperative approaches. It's not an unuseful way to deal with this. It legitimizes cooperation at levels other than party, uh, and as such, you know, you expect to see something like this into agreement because the parties and the cities have play have been playing an important role and they're being encouraged to participate. But it's probably not good to have this in the operational part of the agreement because they will not be able to be operational. The operational part is for parties. It will have to be in the more declaratory part. So I think it's useful, but in the wrong place of the of the agreement. Article three bis is a red plus uh, is a red plus article. Article three bis establishes a red plus mechanism. And people say, what the heck is a red plus mechanism? It's, 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 it is very much a, an article that's been introduced by the Coalition for Rainforest Nations to so have people who feel red as very dear to their heart. And the way it is being written, it's, it could be, and the way it's placed, because it's placed as three best before three tear, could be interpreted by some, including myself, as having two objectives. One of them is to provide for a placeholder which is a red plus mechanism, meaning that you will take all the framework, red framework from Warsaw and all every other decision on red, you need a place to validate into agreement. And then you have this thing, you establish a red plus mechanism. Why do you call it a mechanism, which makes a confusion with a market mechanism? Because you have a, a for instance, technology mechanism. 
uh, you have a uh, you know people want the response measures mechanism. So this is the word that's being used. It shouldn't be read too much into it. Is a placeholder for having read. The second objective is to create a red plus space into markets. So if you look at these two objectives, objective one does require a three bis simplified three bis type of, of statement in which you say I want to have a recognition uh, that uh, the red plus exists, it's a valid thing and should be used. How it's being worded is a different story, I think the current wording may be too convoluted. Objective two, to create a space for red plus in markets, that can be covered probably under three tier, which is the one that we'll discuss after this, depending how three tier is being written. If you go into three tier, three tier is the mainstay of the market approaches. And it's the word markets that does not appear. But what appears in there is a, is a discussion on, on a number of options. And one of them is the established, clearly the establishing of a, uh, of, a, of a mechanism to support sustainable development. And then it goes into a number of other things in option one. So what are the comments in this, this particular uh, article 3 there? First of all, is that it is general enough. It just talks about the establishment of a mechanism that will support sustainable development. Does not go into a discussion whether the market or non-market or what it is. But it does establish it and it's vague enough and, and allows everybody to find himself or herself. So the guys with the red plus mechanism will find themselves in there and the people with the, uh, with the CDM plus mechanism will find themselves in here and the people with the adaptation mitigation mechanisms can also find themselves in here. So from that point of view, it could satisfy at this level of detail and granularity, it could satisfy many, many people. The number of issues with it, one of them is refers to establishment of a mechanism and in that case if it's a mechanism which one is it then you can get next year into a fight whether the CDM plus or red plus or whatever it is. So you know that may be an issue. Uh, the second issue is the sustainable development definition, you know the mechanism for sustainable development you could get even though you, you know it may not be necessarily reasonable but you could get some G77 countries reacting and saying, I don't want sustainable development defined at the UNFCCC level. This is something I want to define. So this may be a problem. Now, you also have a reference to the work plan in the agreement. I'm not sure that you need to put that reference in the agreement. And then there are a number of other words that are being included. There are something like own contribution that, you know, this mechanism will allow for creating own contribution. Now, they, there's no definition of own contribution. Some people call this net mitigation. It comes as a remnant in a way of the KP debates where CDM uh, credits, CRs were used as offsets by uh, uh, Annex 1 countries. There was a reaction that you can't offset but you can use, uh, can lead to a net mitigation. And as such, this was introduced into the, uh, into the Paris Agreement. Is it reasonable? This is not the Kyoto Protocol anymore. We don't have Annex 1 and all Annex 1 countries. This definition of developing country and developed country parties, but there's no list. So I, is this still a valid uh, thing to have in the agreement? Option two, again, the, uh, you have the same reference was of, of one mechanism. Uh, the reference, there is, there is a further, uh, this is a more elaborate option. One thing that it has in it, it has a reference to Article 12 of the Kyoto Protocol and that will make it for some as being good closely if you say one mechanism and then you refer in, in, uh, specifically to the art, Article 12 of the KP, then one, one would argue, one will argue that this is very closely identified with, uh, with the, the CDM. So is this the son of CDM or CDM plus and what happens to the rest of them? Again, the same issue of voluntary net mitigation or 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 or, uh, or yeah, net mitigation or uh, own contribution. Option three, it's an interesting option, and that option is being introduced. I frankly, I don't know. I can look back, but I can't remember who it is. But I've heard parties, especially Japan, talking about this in the sense that it it introduces the idea of what happened to the new market mechanism. The new market mechanism, I'll remind you, was created in Doha and there were supposed to be modalities and procedures developed after Doha. 
needless to say, nothing has happened on the substance, but it's still there. So the question is, you know, is being put indirectly through this option three, why am I creating a new mechanism where I don't haven't dealt with my old mechanism that you've created in Doha and that you haven't developed on the list of procedures. So why am I using creating a new one when I have one that is already created? This also leads to a broader discussion, which I think is very reasonable, that nobody's had this discussion, and I would be shocked if we have time to have it in Paris, is what happens to the rationalization of all the mechanisms, because you have a CDM, you have a new market mechanism, which exists, you have GI, you have Article 17, what happens to all these things? You know, you want to create this uh, sustainable development mechanism, how do these things all relate to the other, each other? And that what is the rationalization and when do you rationalize all these things? So you can't just let things float out there. Does anybody have an appetite to discuss this in Paris? My guess is not. But nevertheless, this option three raises the issue. And option four is a is basically putting the sustainable development mechanism in a non-market approach and takes the line that the convention is a non-market approach and as such really the sustainable development mechanism should be very non-market oriented. I think that is a step backwards because the initial option, option one, is vague enough that could allow market and non-market mechanisms to be involved. This one is a Bolivian intervention and really would like to eliminate the market part. Needless to say, I think they're going to run into a solid wall of people that think markets are, are important. Now, then you have Article 6, which is on finance. Article 6 on finance talks about, uh, option 2, talks about carbon pricing and that we should have carbon pricing and encourage carbon pricing. Now this is a confusing thing and I think that all of you, I'll give you my opinion, I think it's, it's going to create a lot of problems. For those of you that do not believe that the role of the COP, of the Paris Agreement, is to set a global carbon price equal a global carbon tax. If you believe that, then, then you're, you're okay with this. If you believe that it is not the role of the COP, and that even if it, some of you may believe it's the role of the COP, it's a physical impossibility that somebody is going to agree in Paris to include the global carbon price and say, guys, everything else that we discussed, it's okay, it's interesting. By, by the way, I'm going to put the global carbon price of 30 euros a ton in the agreement, and okay, there'll be all kinds of provisions and then and everything else is going to be fine because we have a global kind of price. I think that's politically that's impossible and I cannot see China and the US and Brazil and even the EU agreeing with somebody imposing a, a global carbon price. So the only thing that this thing creates is creates confusion. And I would militate that if, it, if you want to have some reference to carbon pricing in general, it should be in the chapeau at the beginning where you say that carbon pricing or, or pricing of, 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 of environmental uh, uh, of environmental scarcity is an important thing and, and so on. Even that I think will run into a, an issue with, with some of the ALBA group. Article 19, again, it has something, a, a, a provision on international transferability of mitigation outcomes. A great thing to have, we're all for it because this is what we think we need to have. But placing it into the into the, the, the finance section really has no place. It just it's completely out of place and creates confusion. So I would militate that yes, it's nice to have it, but it should be somewhere under mitigation, under the mitigation section. Uh, in the in the decision text, most of the action is in Article 34. It's very much a copy paste between uh, this Article 34 and and most of the. Article 3 tear that we discussed into the agreement. The only difference is that in option 1 of this Article 34, there is a reference to multi-window multi -window mechanism, sustainable development mechanism. So the doubt about having one mechanism or more than one mechanism is, is eliminated because there is discussion of a multi-window system. Now, the other thing is, uh, the, the other question that comes across, which is a very important question, if you have a, a decision to establish the mechanism, a, a centrally operated mechanism in the agreement, then it, it, it's very valid and it's very useful because it gives certainty and gives stability and credibility to that particular mechanism. This is what happened to the CDM. However, 
if you create a CDM or a CDM plus or whatever you want to call it under the under the agreement and let's say you create a red plus under the agreement and it's all under the chapeau of a broader mechanism for sustainable development, a specific mechanism under the broader me umbrella of a mechanism for sustainable development. What happens next time where somebody invents yet another mechanism that they want to have it included? So in that case, somebody that somebody is going to come and say, wait a second, I don't want my mechanism to be approved through a COP decision. I want my mechanism under the agreement. Are you going to go and open the agreement with all the risk of opening the constitution and then have it revalidated and re in, in 180 countries? I think that's a little bit a, of a problem. So on the other hand, having the, the, the mechanism like a CDM plus, let's argue as a name, in the decision creates the problem that, okay, it's, much, it's a much weaker statement because it can be changed by a COP decision and that provides for instability as we have seen. So in terms of what is next and what we think uh, we have going into Paris, I don't think we have a mystery. I think the parties are not that far apart on what is needed except those that don't want the provision. There are some that do not want the provision. And, and the problem is that those that do not want a provision may be at the different extremes. Some don't want a position because they hate markets. The other one don't want a permission because they don't want the UNFCCC to give them permission or ask the UNFCCC for permission. They think there's an entanglement. So, you know, I mean, but what are the consequences of having provisions? The consequences are for those of, of, of those that are of a school that we should not have a provision, they think that not having a provision eliminates the problem and this thing disappears. Not so, because I can assure you that a lot of parties will say there's nothing in the agreement not allowing me to do that, therefore I will do it and I will do it under my own rules. If this is what people want to have no rules in the UN and everybody creating their own rules, this is what they're going to get. Business is providing the signals that there's certain value, stability and having the, as much as possible in the agreement. That's what it is. There's no need for a direct market reference. I think that everybody kind of agrees that the, the word market does not need to come into the, the, the agreement. And that there is a need nevertheless for recognition of international cooperation, of international transfer, and an international mechanism. Do we need to establish the mechanism? Again, we discussed this. And the very important thing that I want to leave you with, and this is, you know, we've seen this in a number of cases that we discussed in the last 10, 15 minutes, which I hope, I, I think I'm over my time, is the balance between specificity and generality. Specificity is very good, you know, and I hate this, this UN agreement that nobody knows what, what they mean at the end, but we all agree to them. But in this case, there is a level that if you want to become too specific in the, in the agreement in Paris, then you're going to fight. You're going to get into fights, into fights that are, you don't need to have in Paris. There is a general a, a level of generality that gives you or gives everybody what they want, and that allows the continuation and the discussion post Paris. So that balance is go, it's not a science, it's an art. Whether the, the the negotiator have mastered that or not will remain to be seen. Mike and Eva, apologies if I'm over time, but I, I hope that I, I I didn't speak too fast. Thanks very much, Andre. Uh, yes, just slightly over time, so if we can ask the other uh, presenters to be mindful of the clock. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone that you can submit questions um, via this uh, platform. So if, uh, as you're going along, if you have any questions you'd like to ask, then just write them down and they'll be sent to me. And then following the presentations, we'll do a Q&A session uh, with all the panelists. So next, I would like to invite Dr. Catherine Watts from Government Market Watch to uh, talk about the considerations to avoid the buildup of hot air in the Paris Treaty. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining this webinar. webinar and uh, I hope Andre, I think Andre's um, presentation has given us a good background to what's in the Paris text. Um, as it currently stands. I'll be talking through more from an NGO perspective of what we would like to see, raising some of the concerns with some of the, um, the remaining opennesses or the loop, you know, the, the, the um, 
lack of decision and clarity that we have in the text at the moment. So first of all, as an NGO Carbon Market Watch Nature Code's overarching aim is to ensure the environmental integrity of any use of international carbon markets. And that, of course, immediately raises the obvious question of how do we do this? So first of all, I think it's really important to remember what, what it is that we're trying to do. We're trying to limit the worst impacts of climate change. And the most recent UNEP GAP report talked about um, the remaining global carbon budget that we have. And their finding was that exceeding an estimated budget of just 1,000 1, gigatons of CO2 equivalent would increase the risk of severe, pervasive, pervasive and in some cases irreversible climate change impacts. I think also at this stage in my presentation it would be important to differentiate between talking about international offsets and emissions trading under a cap because there are different issues related to those. So for emissions trading, if they want to be useful, if, if those market mechanisms do want to contribute to staying within the, the remaining global carbon budget, the caps must be ambitious. And I think it's also useful to note at this stage that the intended uh, nationally determined contributions take us towards a three degree world, not a two degree world or the 1.5 degree world that the most vulnerable countries are looking for. Emissions trading does offer a means to potentially mitigate at lower cost by increasing the pool of cost efficient emissions reductions. However, again, what we're really trying to do is decarbonisation. We need to get to zero carbon by 2050. We have this, this very limited global carbon budget, and so trading needs to be supplemental to ambitious and transformative climate, uh, domestic climate action. Talking about international offsets, we had the situation in the Kyoto Protocol where you had developed countries that had a cap that would be buying offsets from developing countries that didn't have a cap and thereby hopefully in, investing in their sustainable development. However, this effectively just lowers the cap, uh, the ambition of the cap in the developed countries. And with this remaining global carbon budget, I think we need to be thinking about ways of moving beyond offsetting and really pushing forward on that transformative domestic climate action so that we avoid lock into high carbon infrastructure, high carbon ways of doing things. Which is not to say that uh, developed countries don't need to be supporting action in developing countries. I think it's crucial that we start mobilizing the climate finance on a much bigger scale um, so that we actually get the action that we need, so that we do have that transformative domestic climate action, not just in developed countries, but across the board. And this slide just shows quite nicely the difference between carbon offsets, which is what we have in the Kyoto world, whereby developed country parties send money over to the developing countries investing in um, offset projects but claim the carbon dioxide credits for doing so and counting them towards their own emissions reduction uh, emissions reduction targets. What we have now is that developing countries have put forward their own emissions reduction targets or actions and so what really we need to say in summary for what I was saying on my last bullet point is that developed countries provide climate finance but the emissions reductions that that produces are counted towards the developing countries' climate action. And I think it is really important to note that under the convention, developed countries do have an obligation to provide climate finance to developing countries. So a crucial way of keeping us within the global carbon budget is avoiding hot air. And first I'll speak to what it is and then talk a little bit more about it. So first it's carbon permits that don't represent real emissions reductions. And if these are used by countries to count towards their emission pledges, then you know, effectively um, hot air increases the overall emissions. And there are different ways in which that can happen. You can have the host country and the uh, investor country both claiming that, that hot air credit. Um, and so you have what would be counted in, in the accountancy as two tons of emissions reductions but in reality was only one. And so you have a real risk of inflating what mitigation action is being countered by bad accountancy. And I think we've also had real problems uh, developing hot air, in creating hot air by having lots of non-additional or um, over-credited carbon offsets through the Kyoto mechanisms, the clean development mechanism and joint implementation. And these, some of these were projects that would have happened anyway without the carbon markets. Um, but were being claimed as having been created by them. A third way of creating hot air is having a, is that surplus of em emission units under the Kyoto Protocol, that AAU surplus from countries mainly in the former Soviet Union uh, or the East Bloc who took targets that were um, less ambitious than where the real emissions actually were. 
and there's also a surplus for emissions allowances from some of the existing emissions trading systems where there was over allocation of credits. And just talking a little bit more about hot air under the Kyoto Protocol, um, each country had a carbon budget um, for their units and this created assigned amount units where one assigned amount unit was one tonne of CO2 equivalent. Uh, but the lack of environmental integrity in many ways within the Kyoto Protocol has resulted in 11 gigatons of CO2 equivalent of hot air. And this is what I was. This comes back to what I was saying a moment ago about Russia and some of the East Bloc countries having targets that were much less ambitious than they needed to be. But also some of the projects that were being done under the JI mechanism uh, created EIUs that were unlikely to be additional. And all in all, a recent study by the Stockholm Environment Institute found that the use of JI may have enabled glo global greenhouse gas emissions to be about 600 megatons CO2 equivalent higher than they otherwise would have been, and that's not an insignificant amount. So what does Paris need to agree to avoid hot air? Well, first of all, we need to not carry forward that 11 gigatons of KP credits. Um, some of them were real emissions reductions, but not necessarily all. And pre-2020, we need to uh, avoid an artificial demand for these, some of these credits. Um, some of you going to Paris may have seen that the Secretariat is trying to um, encourage people to buy the credits and cancel them um, to offset their travel towards Paris. Whereas that may be fine for good quality credits, but I, my understanding is the platform doesn't allow a sufficient granularity, to use Andre's word, to actually define which are the good credits and which are the ones that aren't additional. And of course, Paris needs to make sure that it doesn't create mechanisms to create new hot air. Um, one way through to do this is through ambitious targets and uh, creation of a ratchet mechanism to ensure that there's increased ambition going forward. Um, and the first review of that ratchet mechanism should be in 2018 to review the, the first round of INDCs. So some of the other things that Paris needs to deliver on to ensure that we have environmental integrity in this process is to avoid double counting and mitigation. I've mentioned earlier that it's possible that if you don't have the right systems in place for the host country and the investor country to both uh, claim um, a mitigation credit. And one way to start dealing with this potential problem is to ensure clarity and tracking of, um, of the credits within the registries, but also to have a common and uniform MRV system so that you have a really good information base on what's being done, where, by whom, and where the credits are mo moving around. And it would also require deletion from national inventories of any credits that are sold from countries, particularly ones from sectors covered in the country's INDC, to avoid that double counting um, problem. But there's also a potential problem of double counting between mitigation and finance. I mean, I think it's perfectly plausible to say that the CDM acting both as a source of climate finance but as a source of um, credit generation potentially had the ability to allow double county of mitigation in finance. And again, to ensure that this doesn't happen is to have a uniform MRV system that gives really good transparency on what's counted as climate finance. But I think there's also real potential for revamp revamping the CDM so it's a finance mechanism so that it because we are in the world now where develop, develop, many developing countries have put forward their targets on what they'll do, um, many of them have parts of the pledge that are contingent on receiving support. And with the CDM, countries have in place a real infrastructure for developing projects and for moving things forward. And it's perfectly possible that this could be revamped or you know, this infrastructure could be taken forward as a finance mechanism. What Paris also needs to do is establish some clear binding principles if there is to be use of markets. Um, I talked about supplementarity before. We need that strong domestic action um, and the strong domestic transformations. I think it's also very important that we have net atmospheric benefit because you know, we have seen problems with the quality of some of the credits that have been counted towards targets. And one way that we could actually address this is through discounting so that you would have to buy two, three, or some number of offsets to count as one unit of offsets. And so that if there are real questions around the quality, that this can be addressed in this way and that you are ensuring that there is really a net atmospheric benefit through that offsetting. And also there are some mandatory quality criteria that should be used, that emissions reductions should be real, permanent, additional. They need to be verified through that MRV system I was talking about. 
And it's also really important that they contribute to sustainable development because, as we all know, you can't have climate action that's unsustainable in the long term. And on the other hand, you can't have truly sustainable development that doesn't give you resilience to climate impacts and that doesn't propel you forward into the low carbon world. And to ensure that the markets do contribute to sustainable development, I think it's really important that there are really good institutional safeguards to prevent social and environmental harm and to uphold human rights. And this is not something that we've always necessarily seen through you know, some of the existing market mechanisms. Um, for any future offsetting, I think there needs to be a negative list of some of the project types that we found to be unsustainable through experiences um, within the CDM, and these should include any fossil power. I mean, we're finding reports, for instance, earlier this year from Deutsche Bank that they reckon that by 2016, 80% of the world will have solar PV at grid parity. There's no reason to be investing in fossil power anymore. Large, large hydro also has its problems in terms of uh, land tenure, human rights abuses, um, and also methane emissions that come from the rotting vegetation. Nuclear, well, simply unsustainable. CCS, um, red and lulu CF also, because I think there are some important questions to be raised about whether fossil and biological carbon are actually fungible, bearing in mind the different um, stability of the storage, fossil carbon has been locked up for 300 to 360 million years in a perfectly stable way, whereas biological carbon is subject to climate change impacts and you know, social and economic impacts also, and so is much less of a stable source, stable storage site. Um, and there's also this, the difference on the time scales of actually um, how, they, how the carbon moves through the carbon cycles for the biological carbon and for the fossil carbon. And I think another area where the negative list needs to draw a line and make certain project types ineligible is the HFC destruction and N2O from a dipic acid production. But carbon markets do offer the opportunity to be an important source of climate finance, and we have the precedent from the CDM setting a 2% levy which feeds into the adaptation fund, and this is a precedent that we think should be taken forward on all UN carbon markets to start generating additional finance for adaptation, loss and damage, and for Red Plus also. But uh, that's me, so thank you very much for listening and for your attention, and I look forward to questions later. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and moving right along, let's pass the microphone to um, Aki Kashi from uh, Adelphi, who's going to talk about uh, joint fulfillment of climate targets and what it means for linking and accounting. Aki, you there? Okay, I think you're you're self muted, so you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm having some issues. I did. Um, yeah. Thank you also to Andre Marcou and. Um, to Catherine Watts for your for your introductions, um, good overlook overview of of the Paris Agreements. Um, I am speaking on behalf of my capacity as a sort of, to some extent as a as a technical advisor to ICAP, the International Carbon Action Partnership. Um, but anything I say will obviously be on my own behalf, and I'm not necessarily responsible representing ICAP's uh, views or any of its, of its members. Um, ICAP works um, on various issues with carbon trading, uh, specifically emissions trading schemes, um, specifically to facilitate the future linking of trading programs. Um, I think there's a very fine sort of distinction between linking when you talk about uh, emissions trading schemes and internationally transferred mitigation outcomes, and I'll get into that a bit later. Uh, to some extent, that's um, a bit semantic uh, if you're offsetting or sort of trading uh, allowances. 
Um, Andre Marcou gave us an uh, overview of the various uh, portions of text in the agreement, um, mentioning transparency, accuracy, completeness, comparability, consistency, avoidance of double counting, environmental integrity. Um, regardless of what actually um, comes into the agreement in the end, um, I think it's safe to say that linking was is going to happen. People are different parties to the convention or um, the agreement will work together and there will be some kind of transfer of um, mitigation outcomes. And the question is, how are we going to account for those different um, transfers of out outcomes? Are we going to have a centralized, robust accounting framework um, that would really kind of facilitate um, transparent linking, or are we going to have something that Andre Marcou mentioned towards the end of his presentation, sort of um, a world where people are, lots of people are active, which I think it's good that lots of people are taking the initiative and are engaged, but um, where there's sort of a lack of centralized oversight um, and sort of transparency on how we actually are moving towards the two-degree target. Um, no, I'm having... um, specifically, I want to refer to ICAP's um, ADP submission recently. Um, ICAP has called for su support for parties to be transferring part of their mitigation outcomes. Um, that the that really there is an anchor in the agreement for that to happen, and that um, the, a robust accounting framework will, will support kind of an international oversight um, for how that is happening, who is doing it, where those mitigation reductions are, are happening. Um, that there's an MRV uh, so that we have an idea of how accurate those estimations or, or calculations are, and that we build upon the knowledge and institutions developed uh, by countries and the UNFCCC. Um, specifically on that, I think that there's a lot of sort of, we've learned to speak in a language that uses AAUs and ERUs and CERs and CDM, um, and I'm not sure how much that will all be carried over into the new agreement, um, largely because of the large differences between the Kyoto Protocol and, and what will be, what will likely be the Paris Agreement. Um, thinking sort of about the background and the backbone of how linking has happened in the past, basically um, European Union countries have linked to each other because they've shared their AAU budget through the EU ETS, um, EUAs historically have been have had a very tight tie to the carbon budgets, so to speak, the AEUs of each of its member states, and it is through the backing of the EUAs with AEUs that um, EU member states have basically shared their agreement to reduce emissions. And that is also how um, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein, who are members of the EU ETS, but not of the EU, um, have been um, contributing to their reduction targets. Um, and, that, and that's also according to their INDCs, um, how they intend to continue to fulfill their reduction targets. Um, Iceland and Norway are a little bit more um, explicit about that with their collective de delivery with the EU and its member states. Liechtenstein mentions it uh, tangentially, but it's, it's fairly clear that what's intended there. Um, linking with Switzerland, um, Aifa mentioned that towards the, end, to the beginning of the webinar, um, it's, it's something to be considered. Um, and it's basically, you can calculate a budget based on, on Switzerland's uh, base year and its projection and its um, target year, and that, that's 
not a big issue for the for the international agreement, although it's a question to, to see how, to what extent the, that AUU transfer or w whatever unit in the future will be then communicated exactly in what way to what kind of uh, global COP body. Um, an extension of that, uh, the example was Switzerland, in, the, in general, it's, it's going to be fairly easy to link uh, two Querlo targets, um, quantified emissions reduction, um, basically the AUs of the world. Um, so, I mean, in the, in the past, these were Annex 1 or rather Annex B countries. Um, this will have an, uh, uh, the list will not be probably in some exact annex the way it, it was in the past, but rather we'll have a list of countries that have in their INDCs or then NDCs that um, they have quantified their budget uh, in such a way that you can convert it into an actual ton or number of tons of CO2E. Um, and this is something that one can also do to some extent if, if you say the business as usual scenario is calculated beforehand and I um, want to reduce a certain per percentage from that business as usual level, um, it's fairly easy to also convert that into absolute tons of CO2 and give yourself a budget and, and have that kind of backbone for linking either an ETS or other kind of trades, um, I don't want to say EAUs, but sort of selling um, those mitigation outcomes. Um, one thing I think it's very important to think about is that it's much more complicated to, to link these A, not AU budgets, but the future budgets um, with other kinds of targets. Um, so countries that have dynamic baselines where they update their BAU or whatever baseline scenario they want to reduce from, um, that's going to be a lot more complicated. Countries that have said, my target is to reduce um, the greenhouse gas intensity of my economy, there's so many variables there, how are you going to convert that into uh, absolute tons of CO2? Fixed level targets, um, the major example there I can think of is, is Costa Rica. Exactly how would transferring of a mitigation outcome work with countries where they say my, my level is fixed at a certain year? Um, it's a little bit more complicated. Peaking targets are very complicated. Um, if you intend to peak at 2025 or 2030, um, how are you going to convert that into tons of CO2 to trade? Um, into a, a system either with, with or without an ETS. Um, Non-greenhouse gas targets, if you say I'm going to develop uh, a gigawatt of solar or plant um, X numbers of acres of trees, um, I don't see how you can trade with that kind of thing or other kinds of policy targets, uh, renewable ener uh, uh, energy portfolios or scenarios standards, feed-in tariffs, um, you would need some kind of project-based uh, mechanism there and then the, the accounting to link that to an ETS, to bring it into an ETS or to link it um, with countries with a, a absolute Querlo target is going to be very complicated. Um, adding to this um, is going to be the fact that Although the clean development mechanism is a mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, um, in the Paris Agreement, a lot of parties will not have been party to the Kyoto Protocol, or not, not a lot, but some significant ones, or will have withdrawn from the Kyoto Protocol, but will be participating in the Paris Agreement. Um, so it's, it's actually, from my perspective, unclear how CDM will count for obligations on the Kyoto Protocol or to what extent parties want to recognize that other parties want to count CDM towards their obligations of the Kyoto Protocol. At the same time, I do think that there will be some kind of continuation of a market mechanism on a project uh, sectoral economy-wide scale 
but I think it's important to keep in mind how to discussions about how we are going to account for this given this range of targets that um, are very diverse and uh, very different than what we had under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and just very briefly, coming back to the EU's uh, example, um, I think it's also interesting and insightful to look at what um, Iceland, Norway, and Liechtenstein have talked about um, with regard to their relationship with the EU ETS. Um, Iceland has uh, quite clearly stated what they um, exactly want to do in the event that an agreement with the EU is not reached. Uh, Norway had similarly. Liechtenstein has said um, that they don't actually have control of a lot of what they um, of a lot of the emissions in their sector, so um, that it, it's an interesting uh, reflection of how um, they see their their INDC with respect to others. Um, basically, that's that's all I have here, and um, I don't have a lot of concrete answers because I think a lot of um, provisions in, that, in the Kyoto Protocol and the, in the Paris Agreement are still open, but um, there are a lot of accounting questions that are important to keep in mind and to figure out how we are going to address. Thanks. Thanks, Aki. Um, now we'll move on to our final presenter. Uh, just before we do that, I just want to remind everyone, if you have a question, uh, to please submit it and submit it through the uh, platform here. Uh, we've had a number that have come in already, um, and so we'll, we'll get to these uh, as soon as um, our next presenter, Ms. Femke de Jong, uh, speaks to us about the impact of the Paris Agreement on reform of the EU's current market. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, indeed, my name is Femke and uh, I will be talking a little bit about uh, how the Paris Agreement impacts on EU's climate policies, uh, but also vice versa. Um, so there are different ways how the Paris Agreement would impact EU's climate policies and I've listed some of the points uh, on this slide. Uh, for example, if there is an agreement to opt for five-year review cycles, this should also be implemented in the EU because currently uh, uh, it has been proposed to have a 10-year trading period under the EU ETS, but that this needs to be revised uh, when there is an agreement. Uh, similar things will apply also for accounting for land use um, emissions and removals but also whether or not there will be international oversight on linking the EU ETS with other systems. Uh, but where I will focus uh, today's presentation on is around uh, the carryover of hot air from uh, pre-2020 and how to link uh, uh, or if there is even a link between the hot air under the Kyoto Protocol and the hot air under EU's climate policies. Um, I think this is very important as well since uh, uh, in terms of uh, NGOs one of our key objectives is um, how we can incentivize new and additional climate actions after 2020 and obviously the use of hot air credits from before 2020 could significantly undermine this. Um, so on this slide I try to be clear what between the hot air under the Kyoto Protocol and the hot air on the EU's climate policies. Uh, also for carbon markets and for the international transfer of mitigation outcomes, since um, um, in order to be using markets, you need some sort of international accounting system, as mentioned before, uh, previous presenters, but also need to know how to translate NDCs. Uh, into a specific carbon budget and uh, the use of hot air credits from before 2020 will have an impact on how big each country's uh, carbon budget will be. Uh, so at the moment uh, AUs as said before are sort of the carbon currency for meeting the Kyoto Protocol targets. Uh, this also means that after 2020 unless we have a third commitment, uh, AUs are, will be useless uh, under the Paris Agreement. Um, so if you look at then the EU's climate policies, in the first uh, commitment 
period of the Kyoto Protocol, so this is from 2008 up to 2012, EU allowances were shadowed by AAUs. Uh, and AAUs, um, it was able for EU member states uh, to uh, meet their targets by purchasing uh, AAUs. From 2013 onwards, um, this has not been the case anymore. Um, so AAUs cannot be used for compliance anymore with EU's climate policies and therefore there has been a decoupling between the AAUs from the EU's allow own allowances. Uh, at the same time, uh, the EU allowances are the currency at the moment for meeting EU's uh, emissions trading system targets, so uh, the targets for EU's carbon market. So that means that uh, EU, the EU is still able to use its surplus EUAs for compliance with EU's post-2020 uh, targets. And uh, this raises a very uh, important, I would say, it's not necessarily a technical question since AAUs are, are not, uh, are probably uh, cannot be used anymore after 2020, but it's a political question which has to do with uh, what kind of political message the EU will send um, uh, to countries around the world if it will use its pre-2020 surplus to meet its 2030 climate target under the Paris Agreement. Um, so, um, what we've heard very recently from Europe, uh, Europe's uh, Environment Agency is that the EU will significantly overachieve its 2020 climate targets. So, uh, we have a target of 20% emission reductions, but we will actually achieve 24 to 25% emission reduction by 2020. And this is mainly due to several factors, but uh, I will list some. First of all, we have a climate target that is inadequate in the sense that it was set above business as usual emission levels, but also uh, in the sense that it is below what we need to do um, uh, to reach a, a two decades climate target. Secondly, uh, there has been a, a large inflow of and use of international carbon offsets with often a very low environmental integrity. And finally, the economic recession has reduced uh, uh, emissions in the EU, which is also have been why uh, targets were, were sort of set to lose. So the result of, of, of this uh, overachievement is the accumulation of excess emission allowances, uh, what uh, we call often surplus or hot air allowances. And I guess a key question for the EU, but probably also for, um, the, uh, for Paris in general, because it might set a precedent for other countries to follow or not, is what will happen to this EU's hot air after 2020. Um, so it's then very important to realize that EU's climate framework is made out of two uh, main climate policies, the EU's carbon market, the EU ETS, um, and uh, the effort sharing decision, uh, which covers all the other sectors, so uh, transport, agriculture, uh, waste and buildings, and it sort of sets uh, annual targets for each EU member state uh, for the years 2021 up to 2030. And so each of these policies will generate a certain amount of emission reductions and we have done some initial calculation based on uh, where EU stands in 2020 and where we need to stand in 2030 to reach our 2030 climate target. And this means that um, between, in this 10-year period the EU uh, will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by about 4 billion tons of CO2 two equivalents, uh, around 1.8 billion tons of CO2 emission reductions uh, will be achieved in the EVTS, and around 2.2 billion tons of CO2 emission reductions will be achieved in the effort sharing decision. So let's first talk about the impact of uh, sort of the surplus in the EU's emissions trading system on uh, our 2030 climate targets. Uh, so by 2020, uh, there will be a surplus equal to 2.6 up to 4.4 billion tons of CO2 equivalent in the EU ETS. Um, this hot air uh, under current policies will be automatically carried over into the post-2020 period and could thereby significantly undermine the environmental integrity of the EU ETS. And just for your reverence, uh, below we have put a picture that sort of shows how large the surplus of emission allowances could be by 2020 compared to uh, uh, the amount of emission cuts that we will achieve uh, um, uh, in the same uh, in the 10-year period following 2020. 
the good thing is that recently we have set up a market stability reserve that will temporarily store part of the hot air um, and it is uh, expected that only around 700 million tons of CO2 equivalent will return to the EU ETS in the 10-year uh, uh, period after 2020. So what is the impact uh, or the potential impact of carryover of this hot air in the EU ETS? Um, uh, it's quite significant, uh, we would say, um, and the thing is that um, it doesn't stop in 2030. So as long as the EU doesn't address uh, the surplus in EU's carbon market, uh, it will have an effect uh, also post-2030 on our, uh, the amount of emission reductions that the EU will achieve. So rather than uh, what we have set out to achieve, which is the 43% CO2 emission reductions by 2030, we will in fact only achieve a 37.5% emission reductions target by 2030. Um, um, therefore, our recommendation would be uh, to start permanently cancelling um, a surplus, and this can be done by, uh, what we say, uh, cancelling at least 2 billion tons of CO2 equivalent at the end of 2020. This is basically all the surplus that will be stored in the market stability reserve by that time. So moving on uh, to the EU's effort sharing decision, also there the EU will overachieve uh, its 2020 target. So the European Environment Agency has uh, calculated that by 2020 a surplus equal to 1.5 up to 1.7 billion tons of CO2 equivalent will have accumulated. Uh, this is excluding the possible use of international carbon offsets, so this surplus could be even bigger than this. Uh, at the moment, this surplus will not be automatically carried over into the 2030 effort sharing decision, but uh, we have seen uh, some uh, European countries that are calling for this. Um, uh, obviously, also carryover of this hot air will significantly undermine uh, the amount of uh, mitigation actions that the EU will achieve uh, after 2020. So what is the impact of carryover of this uh, surplus uh, in the effort sharing decision? Uh, as you can see in the figure on the right, this will have a, a, a very big impact on our uh, target uh, for the sectors covered by the effort sharing decision, so for the transport, agriculture, waste and building sectors. Rather than achieving a 30% cut in CO2 emissions, we will only achieve a 19% cut in CO2 emissions uh, by 2030. Um, so our recommendation would be that these up to 1.7 billion tons of CO2 equivalents of hot air should not be allowed to, to be used in the post-2020 period. Um, this is a, a graph that shows that um, if we allow full carryover of all EU's hot air, rather than achieving 4 billion tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions, we will only achieve 1.6 billion tons of greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, between 2021 and 2030. So it's very good to remember that from all the, um, without a proper international accounting system and without clear carbon budgets for each country, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to know um, what will be the emission reductions that are achieved by each country unless we have some sort of common rule that makes clear that uh, this hot air should not be allowed to be used after 2020. Um, this is a graph that shows for our overall 2030 target how, do, how is it undermined uh, by surplus carryover. And it basically shows that the EU has submitted a 40% cut in our uh, emission, uh, CO2 emissions, but rather than achieving this 40% uh, cut, uh, we will only um, uh, achieve a 32% cut in our CO2 emissions if we allow for full carryover of the surplus uh, in EU's climate policies. Um, uh, this is quite significant and always at the bottom of, the, of every slide we have put, um, because the target is just in one year and uh, at the bottom we have put uh, what this means in terms of CO2 emission reductions in a 10 year period. And also here you can see that the impact is uh, quite significant. Um, so this is my final slide. Uh, I would advise everyone to also have a look at our website if they want to have more information. Um, we will also uh, have a presentation, uh, we also have a side event at the EU Pavilion on 2 December 
uh, that will touch upon uh, some of these same issues. Uh, at the same time as uh, on that same Wednesday, we will also launch uh, a computer game uh, around the issue of hot air and its impact um, um, not only on national and regional climate targets, but also for the Paris Agreement as a whole. And I think uh, what we, our main recommendation would be that um, these kind of decisions and the decision what the EU will do with its hot air will also have repercussions, obviously, for the Paris Agreement, because if the EU is allowed to, to use um, surplus allowances from the period up to 2020, it cannot really call upon other countries not to do this, and this could have a significant negative impact uh, on the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Thanks very much, Femke. Um, so now let's, uh, that's it for the presenter, so let's open up the q and uh, I'm mindful that we're running behind schedule, so let's get straight into these. So I've received a number of questions uh, either through this platform uh, or um, uh, through the registration process. Um, again, if you have a question, you can enter it uh, through the, uh, the platform here, and uh, we'll try to get all of these answered. Um, so let's just start in chronological order, then received, probably easiest. So the first one I think um, we'll put to Andre. Um, it comes from Marianne Burles, who has asked, could offsets play a financing role? The financing of offsets would be a way to channel finance, but not to count towards achieving domestic targets. The emission reduction would therefore stay within the host country inventory. The finance con financing country could claim it is funded X amount of reductions, but not account for these in their inventory, if that makes sense. Andre, do you want to have a, a stab at that one? Hey, can, can you hear me? Okay. No, yes. I, I thought I was, I was muted. So if I interpret the, the question correctly is, if you put money, if, 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 if some country puts money into doing, creating credits in, in, in Brazil, if Germany puts money into creating credits in Brazil, they would, so they would put the money, the Brazilians will count the emission reductions, and the Germans will get credit under the finance provision, probably. And, but that's about it. I think that's, if you, if you do it that way, I mean, look, the, the Germans, either you think it's philanthropy, or in which case there is a limited amount of money for philanthropy or for, for, for foreign aid. And there is money, but there is limited amount of money, no matter how you cut it. Or you can say that you count this money for, uh, for, for in, as part of your, your, uh, your contribution or finance in, under the finance chapter. Uh, that's, you know, you can't have double counting, obviously. You cannot count the money under finance chapter and, and get the credit as well. That's not possible. Is that, okay. I'm not sure that answers the question. Uh, well, I guess, um, Marion, if it doesn't, if it didn't, then uh, if you have a follow-up, just feel free to, to enter that um, here, and we'll, we'll try to get to that. So um, next uh, is a question from Matt Spanagel uh, to uh, Catherine Watts. And he's asked, if there's no room for offsetting, do you extend that to LDCs? Uh, so those are least developed countries, and if so, what mechanism might be appropriate to channel climate finance, for example, uh, to, uh, for LDCs, i.e., do, do you still see a role for MRV aspects of the CDM? So thanks, Matt, for that question. I think it goes to some of, uh, it resonates with some of the previous, the previous questions. So. I mean, we really see a need to move away from offsetting and to get broad, climate, ambitious climate action across the board. I did talk about making the CDM potentially into a finance mechanism, um, and it would be on the basis of developed countries fulfilling their um, finance obligations, and perhaps, you know, companies or other entities also looking to buy credits could do so. Um, I'm not an expert on the MRV aspects of the CDM, but I did talk about in my presentation about the infrastructure that's been set up under the CDM, and maybe that's something that could be adapted or brought forward as appropriate to be able to treat it as a finance mechanism. Okay, thanks. Um, and then, uh, actually, while we have you, Catherine, I'm going to combine two of these questions into one. 
So uh, Wang Lixiang and Philip Tetart have asked about um, the unsustainability of CCS Hydro, Red Plus, and Lulu CF. So I know you, you kind of touched on that, but if you wouldn't mind expanding. Okay, well for CCS, I mean, I've, there are different views on that on it as a, a means to reduce emissions at all. But I think there are some clear questions around permanence and one of the problems we've had in the UK, which is probably one of the best places in the world to be thinking about trialing CCS on a larger scale, is this, this question of permanence and the questions about who will take liability for it. So that does seem to be a real issue. Um, also, there doesn't seem to be any real sustainable development co-benefits to it. It's continuing business as usual fossil development, which is really not what we need to be doing. Um, on large hydro, the projects are quite often are generally non-additional, and there have, um, CDM, um, um, Carbon Market Watch does work on a number of projects where there have been some real human rights abuses, where the army's been brought in, people have died, there have been questions of land tenure, so there are some real issues around large-scale hydro. On Red and Lulu CF, I think there's real, my point was more that they shouldn't be brought into the market mechanisms, but because um, the land use sector, or forestry sector accounts for around 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions, it's obviously something that needs to be tackled. Um, the point I was making more was concerns about treating them as fungible with fossil carbon because of the questions around their permanence um, and questions around measuring carbon leak leakage. And depending on the type of project, there are also potentially land tenure problems and other harms. Um, although I think there's a real potential for real good in there as well, and I think there's a real need for greater focus on ecosystem restoration using native species and trying to undo some of the harm that we've done in these sectors. But it's quite a complicated area with a high level of granularity around it, depending on whether it's conserving existing forest, um, dealing with deforestation rates, um, conserving forest, what it means in terms of the agricultural sector, what it means for the people and the environment on the ground in a particular site. So I, it's something that needs addressing, but I certainly argue that the markets are not the place to address it. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let's turn to Aki. Um, this question comes from Keith Alex. Uh, how can we be sure that linking the schemes and creation of tradable assets and emission rights won't make it harder to ratchet down ambition later on. Also, does the prospect of linking uh, fuel, sorry, uh, is the prospect of linking fuel the political dynamics for overallocation, i.e., incentive to create surplus for sale? Um, very good questions. I think that it. Fundamentally, um, no one sets out to design a cap-and-trade scheme that is over-allocated. I think this is something that happens again and again, um, but it's not an intentional mission to say, oh, I'm going to design a cap-and-trade scheme that's over-allocated um, because I may be able to trade it later. Um, I think that there is not going to be much of much language in the Paris Agreement to to prevent this. Um, I think the what needs to happen is each individual jurisdiction jurisdiction for itself um, when they have a cap and trade emissions trading scheme needs to say um, if I'm going to link to this person, is this uh, link going to undermine? my domestic carbon price that will lead to decarbonization in the longer run. Um, and in the linking process, look at how the linking will d affect the price and um, come up with provisions to address that. Um, in, in the EU, uh, when you have an over-allocated market, there have been measures the that have been taken, backloading um, and the future market stability reserve to address over allocation. And um, I think that in the future we will see um, maybe a little bit more emphasis on the carbon price signal um, and over allocation and the dangers of over allocation. And I think that each um, jurisdiction that's ambitious enough to go through the hard work 
to get stakeholder consensus enough to develop a cap and trade scheme, we'll have to look at linking provisions individually and, and to look at to what extent they, that might undermine their, their domestic scheme. Um, I don't think that, yeah, like I said, the, I don't think the Paris Agreement will make that sure or less sure. Um, maybe some kind of uh, provision on supplementarity, but um, it, I agree that it that will make things hard to, to ratchet down or ratchet up ambition later on. But um, at the same time, I also think that if it's if it's completely clear that a cap and trade scheme is over allocated, then it makes it actually quite easy to ratchet up in addition. And I think it's it's a very important role uh, for various stakeholders, including NGOs, to say, look, this system is over allocated. We need some um, some mechanism to create and either scarcity on the market or um, a minimum auction price to drive uh, low carbon investment, um, but I don't see any provisions for that happening in the Paris Agreement. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Aki. Um, Mike, can I can I intervene, Mike, yeah. for a second? Sure. This is Andre. Look, I think that I think that we, you know, my sense is this is a discussion very much about the about COP21 and the, the Paris Agreement, and I think that. We might remind ourselves that the UN and an international agreement has certain uh, competencies, and we shouldn't exaggerate those competencies because it, 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 the uh, the member parties there is no UN. There are parties to the UN, and the parties to the UN are simply not willing to give the UN the power to intervene in certain things. And, Absolutely. And as such, and as such, I don't disagree. For instance, I I, I think it was Femke with her presentation that we've got Western European hot air. I think that's a very very sound analysis. I mean, you know, it, it's very parallel to the to the uh, to the analysis to, to what what happened in, in, in Doha to the Russians and then they lost all their, their AUs. It's, it's very, very parallel. But in that case it was an international unit and issued under the auspice of the FCCC. I think that the UN would have a very hard time intervening in the in the EU. I mean, it's not in a hard time. It's impossible to intervene in the EU internal affairs or how they allocate and how many of these a EU ways they're they're, they're issuing. Uh, I think that the, the case can be made. That the, I'm I'm am sorry, but I think that we are in a, in a bit of a problem here. It's a bit noisy. Apologies. I think that we would the the the, the case would have to be made if you're from a political point of view. Uh, but it, it, not uh, from a regulatory point of view. The second thing that which is very important is to uh, this discussion about overallocation in general. And uh, we all say that it's overallocated, it's overallocated. I don't disagree necessarily that's overallocated, but having a discussion that's overallocated without anything, having anything that is objective, something that tells you why it's overallocated and how much it's going to allocate it, I think that is not a constructive discussion because we will all have different opinions about that. Unless you find, and unless and until you find a methodology, methodological approach of defining what our allocation is and by how much, I think that this is not going to go anywhere. Sorry, I, you have to realize I'm in Brussels, like some of you, and I'm also in the middle of a police police alley uh, that seems to be zip, zipping down and up and down the, my street here, and as such, it's very noisy. So apologies for the noise. That's all right. Can I just respond um, to that briefly, very briefly? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I think that the decision on whether a system is allo over allocated or not is a political decision, um, and uh, it's also going to be a political decision to link with another ET ETS. Um, and if if one doesn't feel like the other system is over allocated, then one won't see the danger of, of importing their credits. Um, I don't know if there is, it's possible to have an objective criteria of what is over allocation, but it's really a political decision to say, this is where I am, this is where I want to go, um, and this is the best tool to get there. I would I would disagree with that. I would disagree with that. I think that there is that it, it, it dangerous. It is a, it's a real danger. It can be 
it can, not, it can be a scientific decision, and then it can be a decision that based on, on if there's a number of ways, including you know, kind of weighting of, of, of the units and their, their, the level of effort that has been put in, in achieving the reduction. Mm -hmm. anyway, but what I'm saying is that there needs to be an objective, thing. otherwise it'll be contested, and we will have indefinite discussions on that. Also on the on the issue, if you on my on the issue of CCS is not good and Red Plus is not good and this is not good, I you know I, I I'm the first one to admit that anything that's counterfactual is also always going to be difficult. There's there's no doubt about that. However, I think we have two choices. Either we're going to use all our tools and and find ways to deal with this, this difficult question, or we're going to start by eliminating and we we, we shall declare from severity. I don't think that helps. Um, hello, I don't know if you can hear me. I would also maybe like to jump in on this point. This is Femke. I think it's a very relevant question on what kind of international oversight there will be on uh, over allocated systems and on the hot air in the absence of international units. I think one of the, the issues that we have also been wondering about is how you can have market mechanisms and an international transfer of mitigation outcomes under the UNFCCC without an international unit. So it comes back, I guess, uh, all to the same question. I mean, um, 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 I think there needs to be international oversight on hot air if you want to allow uh, for international transfers of mitigation outcomes between parties. Um, on the a uh, point uh, around linking, uh, we have also done some analysis on this and uh, we found um, there are quite some 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 risks and downsides uh, to linking too early. I mean, at the moment we're in a, at a stage where all emissions trading systems around the world are over allocated and therefore uh, the price is very low actually. The highest price in any carbon market is in the California Quebec carbon market but there they have a carbon price floor so it, it's a big issue. So I think it's, it's, it's far too soon to talk about linking and it might also not be so relevant at least um, um, EU's carbon market, which is the biggest carbon market in the world. Uh, the EU has a domestic climate target after 2020, uh, and therefore uh, there's very, there's or very limited. There's actually no scope uh, for linking with other carbon markets uh, in the near future. Thanks, Femke. Um, I, so I have a couple questions uh, for you guys as well, um, but I, I wanted to let uh, the group the. Uh, participants um, asked theirs first, but uh, just on the um, on the topic of, of markets, I mean, I, I've kind of been hearing, um, just speaking to various negotiators, that there's, it may turn into a situation where, where markets are kind of uh, held hostage in exchange for other things like, like finance and technology transfer, and that in the end that you basically, you'll, you'll almost need to to buy markets, you know, to buy markets in exchange for finance to have it included in, in the agreement. Uh, just interested to get your views on that. Yes, I mean, I definitely think that um, there are a lot of controversial issues going to be talked about in Paris. Um, markets are definitely one of them, but it may not be the main issue. Um, so I, I do think that there will be a, give, a certain amount of give and take between the different issues uh, that may not otherwise be directly linked to each other. Um, this is Eva speaking. Um, if I may jump in on this question as well, I think it's a relevant question. It's very difficult to answer, I guess, as with every COP. The risk is that there is a last minute um, trade-off of some sort that um, will create or not create a, a certain you know rule set or standards or mechanism um, because of actually another another issue, be it loss and damage or some financial arrangements. It is of course a risk that we've always seen. So the, the, that's why there's also the big question, which is not um, easy to 
to answer what sort of um, details we can have in the Paris Agreement, whether we should ha go on a cautious approach and just if there should be, if there will be a market reference in the text to have some something more overarching to ensure environmental integrity and take time for the time after Paris to then work out what this actually means instead of having maybe a fast reaction and um, and forget about some key principles that that will then again m maybe um, undermine the Paris. Um, pledges. So this is really the big risk, I think, um, yeah, that we've always seen in the political um, last-minute decisions. Okay, great. Um, another one is uh, just in reference to, uh, I think it was um, Catherine or Femke, I think it was Catherine who mentioned it, just about um, the SCI's findings on JI. Um, how do you see this potentially affecting um, the ability uh, of countries to um, be able to perform their own MRV or issue credits under any sort of mechanism going forward. So uh, as you know, with JI, that was one of the main issues is there was no oversight, um, which led to uh, a large amount of questionable credits. Anyone? Mike, sorry, I, I, I'm not hearing you very well. I, I think you asked something about GI, but I wasn't quite clear what it was. Um, I can maybe um, answer the question and explain also, maybe Andre, you want to add on to it. The question was whether the study, the findings of the study, which was um, published, I think it was October this year, um, that found that there was a significant amount of basically bogus credits um, um, issued from joint implementation. Um, I mean, we can go into more details of the findings, maybe also for interested um, people after, but basically the big lesson of the study really is that it shows that there is a, a problem um, for uh, if there's no international oversight, because that's what happened. The joint implementation tracks that exist so far um, do allow for a, a, a process or, or a credit generation system whereby only the host countries um, can issue credits. It really shows that 98%, I think, of all credits um, issued under joint implementation were issued via that track. Um, it raises alarm bells. And I think it's also a good example for Paris agreement, any, any market, market provisions that we will see, because it will be a um, very similar type of JI, because JI exists in countries that have targets. So how do countries trade with each other and, um, and, and respect the targets in a way which the case of joint implementation shows that the rules that we have even under Kyoto Protocol at the moment are not fit enough to avoid that any sort of pleasures are undermined. So it's really good study and lessons that need to be looked at for any, any design of markets. Yeah, thank you very no, much, Eva. We, we agree on many things. We don't happen to agree on this one. Uh, these things happen in life. Uh, look, I, I what I say to this, and. I think I'm as much as anybody else concerned about this planet and about environmental integrity. I think I've got about 20 years in the, in my, on my back. That I would say the following thing. I think that one of the problems with with markets is that people simply do not want to accept the rules. And the rule was that we negotiated targets in Kyoto. Now, if you want to contest the Kyoto target, I'm all for it, and we can have a discussion. But I'm the wrong guy to this because I'm not into targets. But essentially, what all you're saying is that you don't accept the Kyoto target because they were too generous to the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Romanians and the whatever. That's one argument. The second argument is these guys have a target. If they have a target, in my mind, they can issue whatever they want to issue under the target. If their target is, 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 is correct, I don't care how they, what they issue. They can issue anything they want. The, it's, it's, but the, the, the problem is that most people from the beginning have started have 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 used the word hot air, and it's completely acceptable. It became completely acceptable and became the pejorative. So if we accept the rules of the game, because it is a game construct, if we don't accept the rules of the game the way it was built, then this whole thing makes no sense, and I don't think we should do it. I again, I'm I'm not contesting that in the end the the. Uh, Ended up with the, the you know having the, the, the some of the Eastern Eastern European countries, the, the former Soviet Union, having a lot of surplus. The surplus was as a result not any less than the result of, as Femke has said, of what we have now in Western Europe. 
I mean, it was a economic restructuring, a brutal, much more brutal than what we see here. But I think, Andre, I agree with you on that one. The big problem and the scandal of the joint implementation study was that this AAU surplus was not, was not usable anymore because no one needed it, but it could still be traded via joint implementation. So the large majority of traded joint implementation credits come from countries that wanted to launder the AAU surplus, and they did so with the ETS. And that's unfortunately um, also, I mean, it, that's not a good example for international trading because it shows what can go wrong if parties don't respect the rules. But if there's nothing in the future that will ensure that countries have to respect the rules, we are very likely facing the same problem again. I would beg to differ. I think that they respect the rules they just don't like the rules. I think the question is, do we look towards the UN to enforce some kind of ambition? Or do we look towards buyers and the policy makers in, in buying countries to look for ambition and say, these are the kinds of quality credits that I will buy or not buy? And it's, it's, I don't see a role for the future Paris Agreement to say, these credits are good and these credits are bad. I see a role for the EU to say, we are not going to buy international credits right now. I see a role for the US to say, I'm not going to buy international credits right now. And if they decide to, then that will be a quality judgment be made in Brussels and Washington. And I don't see it being made in Paris or Bonn. Okay. Well, that kind of leads me to another question. So given, given the patchwork of actions that we're seeing around the world, so you've got uh, market-based mechanisms that include different sectors, you have different cap reduction rates, you have different price colors, and then even in some of them you have different unit measurements. So for example, even in the US, you have between California and, and Reggie, you've got one is a metric ton and one's a short ton. So, you know, issues of fungibility there. You know, how, even if there were something to come out, in Paris, something quite robust on, on, on markets, how on earth do we link these? And given that the, the concerns raised um, you know, a moment ago, do we not need some kind of, well, to consider maybe having a, an, an independent, a new independent international body to, to manage all of this, um, you know, in, in the chance that, that the UN is maybe not, not capable of doing it or um, you know, perhaps some countries will say, well, you know, we, we would like to, we want to bring in, not, not, you know, obviously not like a central bank, but just kind of a, a, a larger body to, to perform the oversight, to perform the, the calculations and punchability and, the, you know, if, uh, if there's any linking of like a, a network type problem, that maybe the, the exchange rates between the various um, mitigation actions. I think, Mike, I think you already have that. Essentially, yeah, this is, you know, we've, we've done a fair bit of, of writing on this. Uh, it, it falls, it's not necessarily that everything is, is right. I think it's a lot of it is being discovered. The bank, the World Bank is doing some work on something called network carbon market and exchange rates. And the theory is that there is a compliance value, which is the value that the regulator gives for a unit, for a unit, not for a ton, but for a unit versus what the mitigation value, what the perceived value is, what the rating of the value is. And if there is a discontinuity between these two values, then you see a stress. The idea is that the AAUs were seen as a compliance value of a unit of one, but the stakeholders, Eva and, 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 and many, and, 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 and Femke, and many other people, not only them, but many other people, the perception was that an AAU was really not worth a ton because they had not they had not been the result of an effort, right or wrong. I, I would argue that not necessarily right, but not right or wrong. And as a result of that, there was a tension between these two, which led to the elimination of the a whole bunch of AAUs and the second commitment uh, of the Kyoto Protocol under the Doha Amendment. You have the same situation in the EUAs, where the EUAs, the ones that we I think Femke, you rightfully pointed to, 
are the result also of an economic restructuring. That's a, a result of that many people do not find the mitigation value of an EUA as being one anymore, which has led to two things, backloading and, and the MSR, meaning that you take a whole bunch of EUAs of the market because you, your perception is that the value is not one. And that is the way that you may end up in the future. The question that you're posing is who's going to do the rating? And I think this is where you come to very different school of thoughts. The one school of thought is that you have this international body, the super CDM board, the super international regulatory board that will do the rating, that will do what the mitigation value, what the value is. And the second one is, which others are advocating, that you will have a whole bunch of rating agency doing this rating. And that will be, again, getting into a situation where you have where you have rating of, of financial instruments and rating of bonds of countries and so on. Is that the way forward or not? I mean, I'm sure that many people on this call would argue that, you know, Moody's and Standard & Poor's have, have failed quite badly in the last round of economic stress and financial stress and cannot be trusted with this, but a discussion that we need to have. If I uh, quickly can jump in here, I think, you know, when listening to this, one question could also comes to mind is why? Why should we set up another very complicated system where we discount different allowances just in order to link with each other? I mean, in a way, um, there has always been this argument that linking different carbon markets and uh, going towards a global carbon market is something we should strive to, but it also sounds like it's extremely uh, complicated, uh, both technically but also politically, uh, because you lose a certain uh, democratic control on your own climate target and your own carbon markets when doing so. And if you need different rating agencies and, and, and in a way more financial control, we just may be overcomplicating the system for very little or no benefit. It, it seems um, um, we should not forget why uh, we have carbon markets in the first place. Thanks. Uh, I just want to let Catherine um, chip in. I think she, she wanted to uh, just answer a couple things that we were speaking about earlier. Catherine, are you, are you there? I'm here. I mean, it's interesting listening to this conversation because it almost sounds like there's a push to have carbon markets for the sake of carbon markets and, you know, this push for linking, this push for, you know, even setting up new bodies to try and pull things together in a way that potentially leads to a race to the bottom. And I think it's just important, again, to go back to that first slide that I put up, that what we need to be doing is transformative, radical action to decarbonize our economies by 2050. And how to design carbon markets to make that happen? Carbon markets and other policy instruments, but there are other policy instruments, and we need to look carefully where carbon markets are the most appropriate instrument, but we also need to look carefully where they're not. Okay. It's not a policy instrument, and what is a carbon market? Um, great. I'm, so I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to uh, close by uh, posing one more um, question from uh, an attendee uh, to all of you. So whoever would like to answer can speak up, and then after that we'll, we'll wrap things up. Um, so this one's from Julian Short, who has asked, uh, is it realistic to expect fundamental de decisions on the future of, of markets in Paris? Isn't it much more likely that the door is simply kept open for market mechanisms under the UN, UNFCCC without going too much into details? Yes, I mean, there won't be time to work into the details in, in Paris. Like, we will either have a hook or with a hook with some robust uh, accounting, or we won't have a hook, um, but the, but the nitty-gritty details of, of market instruments or transferred mitigation outcomes will not be defined uh, in, in full in Paris. There's just not time. I, I, I don't think there's any question that there will not be any kind. Actually, you don't want to have a definition in detail. It, it's very unfortunate because we've been discussing this for the last many, many, many years. 
So it tells you a little bit that, that you know, how efficient the system is. Unfortunately, we don't have another one. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that you are at the stage now we have reality has to kind of set in because we're, you know, in three days, many of us go to Paris. And if we, if we want to have a detailed discussion, the more detailed discussion, the more the probability of actually running into a fight because you discover things that you disagree with. And as such, the, the reaction may be, let's not put anything inside because we disagree. I think that's a, that's, that's a possible outcome, but unlikely one, because as I mentioned before, the outcome of having no provision is not that you're not going to have mechanisms or you're not going to have a market, international market, not domestic market, that's outside the preview of the UN anyway, but an international transfer system it will just happen without any international supervision at all. So, you, you know, if that's what the outcome that we want, then we will get into the details of it and we'll kind of collapse the whole discussion and, and people will say, well, I don't want to deal with this. I'm the, I'm the minister from this and that. This is 10 o'clock in the evening, Friday night. I can't solve this one. You know, guys, go away. Anyone else uh, like to make some final words? No? Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, our panelists um, and uh, Carbon Market Watch and Eva um, for organizing this. Uh, I know we, we ran a bit over time, but hopefully it was helpful and therefore worth it. Um, this presentation, uh, the recording of the presentation will be available online, um, as will the presentations um, of the attendees, except for Andre Marcou, uh, whose presentation won't be available until uh, Sunday, I think you said, Andre. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you, um, sorry, did someone want to jump in? No, um, thank you, Mike. I mean, I just wanted to add as well um, that we will make um, all the material available to the registered participants, including um, there will be a link to the recorded session if anyone wants to listen to it again. Um, we will also have a probably a, a summary report about it. Um, and if anyone wants to be, wants to discuss any of these issues in more detail, we'll be very happy to um, continue the discussions outside of this webinar. Um, everyone knows how to find us. So um, with that, I'd like to um, very much thank all the panelists for taking the time and effort to contribute your perspectives and views and um, also all the participants for the interest and especially also Mike for moderating it. Um, but I'm, I, I'm not sure if I interrupted you, so... <laughs> um, no, no, it's, it's all right. Yeah. You <laughs> so are... thanks everyone, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, I just wanted to add also that uh, uh, a bit of a plug for ours as well. We'll be covering COP um, uh, in depth uh, at Carbon Pulse. So if you want to follow it, it's at carbonpulse.com. And then from there, you can also sign up for our free daily newsletter. Uh, the link is just on the right-hand side. Um, that's sent out at the end of, of every day here in uh, in Europe, sometimes in, in the middle of the night. And, uh, when uh, we're, we're swamped with stories, but um, yeah, I mean, we, we're hoping to be the, the go-to news source for market-related issues uh, in COP, so please uh, have a look if you haven't already and sign up. So thanks to everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your week, and hope to see many of you in Paris.